people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The political atmosphere in Pakistan is becoming increasingly intense as the nation grapples with a series of seismic events. Former Prime Minister Imran Khan's arrest has sent shockwaves through the country. He was found guilty of corrupt practices in the state gifts case, resulting in a three-year jail sentence and a hefty fine. However, the drama didn't end there. A few days later, Khan was dealt another blow as he was barred from politics for five years by the Election Commission of Pakistan. This turn of events marks a critical juncture in Pakistan's contemporary political landscape. Imran Khan once hailed as a charismatic leader who promised a new era of transparency and accountability has now become a symbol of controversy. His arrest and subsequent disqualification have deepened the existing divisions within the nation. Khan supporters are crying foul, labeling the charges as politically motivated and accusing the establishment of orchestrating his downfall. I think that everything has been done in the past of the Sajish. Imran Khan, when the Prime Minister was the Prime Minister, he was the Prime Minister. कि इमरान खान आए अपने आप पाकिस्तान बनेगा और मुल्क में कुछ कुशाली की तरफ मुल्क जाएगा लेकिन अभी जो सूरत हाल है इमरान खान के जाने के बाद नई हुकूमत आई है इससे हवाम तो बहुत ज़्यादा ही परेशान हुई है महंगाई इमरान खान की हुकूमत से अगर कंपेयर किया जाए वो दुख नहीं हो गई है On the other hand, his opponents view his conviction and disqualification as long overdue steps. towards cleansing the political system. The state gift case, commonly known as the Tosha Khana case, revolved around allegations of Khan and other officials receiving luxury vehicles and gifts from foreign dignitaries during his tenure as Prime Minister. The court's decision to find him guilty and sentence him to jail time has also fueled discussions about the fairness of the judicial system and the effectiveness of the National Accountability Bureau or NAB in tackling corruption. Amidst this chaos, Pakistan has dissolved its parliament and is now seeking an early vote. I have a full belief that the caretaker set-up is a caretaker set-up. The election commission has a great responsibility that the time is closed on the time, and it is not possible to do it at the time, so that the election can be closed. Because in Pakistan, there is a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, and a lot of pressure, and a lot of pressure. For both of them, the election is very important for both of them. How the key question that arises at this juncture is, can Shabazz Sharif, the Prime Minister, ensure victory after Imran Khan's exit from the political scene? The role of the deep state, believed to be the mastermind behind Pakistan's political landscape, will also be a critical factor. Which direction will it lean in this evolving scenario? The Election Commission of Pakistan's move to disqualify Imran Khan from politics has raised questions about the impact this will have on his party, Pakistan Tehreeke Insaf, and the broader political landscape. This is just another method to try to lessen Imran Khan's popularity, which doesn't seem possible. The Election Com Commission of Pakistan, unfortunately, is tainted. Unfortunately, the Chief Election Commissioner is someone who is tainted to be a tout of the PDM government. Um, we, it doesn't matter what notification they take out. There's not a single person in Pakistan Tariq and Saf does not believe Imran Khan is no longer their chairman. 
The recent sequence of events surrounding Imran Khan's arrest, conviction and subsequent disqualification have injected a renewed sense of volatility into Pakistan's political landscape. The nation is grappling with the consequences of these developments from questions of justice and accountability to potential shifts in power dynamics. As Pakistan moves forward, it must navigate these challenges with a focus on stability, transparency and the well-being of its people. The road ahead is uncertain and the nation's course will be defined by the choices it makes in these crucial moments. Moving on. Amid Afghanistan's economic challenges and diplomatic efforts, a recent Taliban's delegation trip to Kazakhstan emerged as a crucial move. Seeking to bridge the gap in the isolated banking sector, discussions with private banks took center stage. This mission holds the potential to reshape Afghanistan's economic landscape and global relationships, marking a significant chapter in the nation's journey towards stability. In a recent trip to Kazakhstan, a group of Taliban representatives started talking to private banks in an effort to fix Afghanistan's banking problems. The head of the trip, Acting Commerce Minister Nuruddin Azizi, didn't just stick to banking. He also talked about special trade tariffs, projects in telecommunications and paths for moving goods. There is even a possibility that these paths could help transport Russian oil to South Asia. Since the Taliban took control two years ago, after foreign troops left, Afghanistan's money systems and worldwide transactions haven't been working well. To tackle these problems, U.S. officials had meetings with Taliban members and experts from Afghanistan ministries in Doha last month. البته به خودتان معلوم است که از طرف یو ایس تریجری یا دیگه همو برنامه که خود امریکا دارن من دقیق معلومات ندارم لیسانس نمبر 21 به خاطر اقلام تجارتی افغانستان اجازه داده شده هیچ محدودیتی نیست Their discussions covered a wide range of subjects, including women's rights, security, stabilizing the economy, and combating drug-related issues. Despite the Taliban's return in 2021, Afghanistan's economic difficulties persisted. Their strict rules, especially regarding women's jobs, made the already tough situation even worse. This led to many people not having job opportunities. For the Taliban to gain recognition on a global scale, they need to pay attention to advice from around the world. This means they should change their strict rules and follow international standards. The situation requires them to move away from their rigid policies and align themselves with what the rest of the world considers normal. Afghan leaders have consistently tried to attract investments from other countries. However, concerns remain because the current environment isn't suitable for business activities. Hatta to pain fisat masarif banki me parten. Amir ma me khoyem ki ami masarif banki andaktan ya dega sadrat Afghanistan waqti ki agar ruyi barnama hai تسهیلات بانکی ما زیاد کار نکنیم و صورت نگیره از راه های غیر قانونی پول پرداخت میشه و این به نفع افغانستان هم نیست به نفع کشور کسی که کشور دومی که مثال ما از او واردات داریم به نفع از او هم نیست و به نفع جامعه جهانی هم نیست مینوال دی طالبان منتینز این انترست این اٹریکٹنگ فورن انویسمنٹس particularly in the lithium sector. They assert the necessity of lithium for global advancement, suggesting a mutual benefit in its exploration and exploitation. 
هر کشور میتونه در افغانستان در بخش لیتیم افغانستان سرمایه گذاری کنه چون امید مردم افغانستان البته لیتیم و لیتیم ما نمیخوایم خدا نخواسته حیف مایل یک شرکت شوه یک کشور شوه یا یک نفر شوه یا صد نفر However, the international community's willingness to engage hinges on the Taliban's adherence to broader reforms. Amid this delicate balancing act, Afghanistan yearns for stability. Recent events like the delegation's trip to Kazakhstan and the subsequent diplomatic dialogues underscore a complex narrative. It intertwines the past and present, where a nation strives to move beyond its tumultuous history, seeking economic prosperity political recognition and social inclusivity. Whether Afghanistan can surmount its challenges, reinvigorate its economy and foster an environment conducive to international collaboration remains a question that unfolds against a backdrop of uncertainty. The Quad Grouping consisting of India, the US, Japan and Australia has converged once more this time upon naval waters to conduct their annual Malabar exercises. These nations have strengthened their collaborative efforts across various fronts, with India's INS Sahayadri and INS Kolkata and Japan's formidable fleet, they address China's regional challenges. Experts have time and again opined that these like-minded countries can counterbalance and displease China, showcasing their solidarity. The Malabar exercises also signifies global economic cooperation amid crisis. Have a look. Gathering on the vast expanse of naval waters, the Quad Alliance, composed of India, the United States, Japan and Australia, has reassembled for their annual maritime spectacle, the Malabar exercise. This strategic congregation demonstrates the resolve of these nations to bolster their cooperation across multiple domains in response to China's increasing assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. India, situated in the immediate vicinity of China, has dispatched its indigenous frontline warships, INS Sahyadri and INS Kolkata, as a testament to its commitment to regional security. Japan, too, Bearing the brunt of diplomatic and territorial tensions with China has marshaled its significant naval assets to underscore its presence and determination. Exercise Malabar reinforces our shared commitment to working together uh, as partners in our region to ensure that we maintain a stable, prosperous and resilient region for us all uh, to enjoy. The exercise takes on heightened significance given recent China-US confrontations stemming from China's progressively invasive behavior in Indo-Pacific countries. The Quad nations united in their principles aim to counterbalance these provocations, a stance that has drawn displeasure from China and underscores the widening divide. The Malabar exercise itself symbolizes more than just naval prowess. It's a tangible manifestation of cooperation between major global economies grappling with multifaceted crises. When we got together, the US uh, Navy and the Indian Navy, it was uh, really a big step because of our uh, history during the Cold War years. And uh, I think we, we made a great beginning. From there on till 2007, moved to 2007, where the, our Australian friends joined for the first time in the Bay of Bengal. And that signified something else, that uh, the four uh, nations, four democracies uh, can work together in the maritime domain. And uh, that sent some signals uh, around the world. As the Quad nations aligned their naval forces, they also align their interests to create a robust front against instability and turbulence. Australia, having withdrawn from the Quad in 2008 due to China's objections over its participation in the Malabar exercise, has now rejoined the alliance. HMAS Brisbane led the fleet through Sydney's waters, formally inaugurating the 10-day war training maneuvers. 
the four of us will also have an opportunity to share thoughts about what are some really challenging times right now. And so the deterrence that our four nations provide as we operate together as a quad uh, is, is a foundation for all the other nations operating in this region. So it's a, it's a privilege for me to be here. Admiral Smith, thank you for your leadership. The Quad's revival with Australia inclusion in 2020 reflects the Alliance's resilience and its commitment to collective security, even in the face of China's persistent criticism and accusations of containment. As Quad countries' vessels navigate the oceans together, they not only enhance their maritime capabilities but also send a clear message of deterrence and collaboration to regions near and far. Time now for Asia This Week. These stories from across the continent. At least nine people were killed across Vietnam after landslides and floods were triggered in the Southeast Asian country, state media VTV reported this week. Footage recorded last Monday showed various provinces in both the north and the south of the country inundated by flood water, which left several roads damaged and motorists stranded. According to local media, heavy downpours with precipitation readings of 100 to 200 mm have been recorded in Vietnam's northern region since August 4. Vietnam's Prime Minister Pham Minh Chi also issued a notice requesting local authorities to increase their response and provide aid to affected areas, reported local media. Providing alternatives to children using screens during their downtime, trainer Ahmed Abul Hawa created exercise programs that can keep them busy but also promote physical and mental well-being for Palestinian children in Jerusalem. His classes involve children aged 9 to 15 where they perform a number of functional movements. He also aims to spread awareness about the importance of having a healthy diet as an essential part of overall wellness. With other specific sport activities available in the east side of the city, such as basketball and football clubs, gyms for children are not very common and many youngsters are turning into fitness classes at Hawa Studio. The gym is located in Sheikh Jarrah, a neighbourhood that has witnessed tension over the past few years, adding a layer of constraints for children to be active in this part of the city. Abul Hava aspires to not only improve kids' physical health, but to also create a place for Palestinian children to develop strength and friendship. South Korea wrapped up an ill-fated World Scout Jambori with a closing ceremony attended by thousands of teenage scouts this week, followed by a K-pop concert. Around 40,000 people gathered for the closing ceremony and concert headlined by K-pop stars including New Jeans and Ivy at the World Cup Stadium in Seoul. When the event began last week, hundreds of participants fell ill after temperatures hit 34 degrees Celsius in Semangam, the campsite built on reclaimed land where the scouts aged 14 to 18 were staying. Scouts from Britain decided to leave the campsite early with the head of their contingent also blaming poor sanitation and lack of food for their departure. US and Singapore scouts followed suit. A scout official said the heat wave and typhoon made the Jamboree, which began on August 1st, one of the most challenging to date. Moving on. From the intricate details of a sari to the bold patterns of a rug, each handloom textile is a work of art that tells a story. A story that traces its root back to the era of the freedom movement for Swadeshi textiles. Today, in our show, we'll provide you with a glimpse of the nostalgic cultural legacy of India's handloom art form, which celebrated its ninth edition of National Handloom Day recently featuring a variety of fashion events and exhibitions that left the spectators in awe. Let's have a look. 
the manual weaving of intricate embroidery on the fabric surface characterized by fine needle work using colorful threads has a significant history dating back to the Swadeshi movement in 1906. The journey of exotic handloom textiles began during the British era by Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Bipin Chandrapal and Lala Lajpat Rai from West Bengal's Calcutta. Today, the vibrant traditional handloom textile holds a special pride on the world stage for its potential to dominate the global market with its eccentric and unique design patterns. On the occasion of the 9th edition of National Handloom Day, which is observed on the 7th of August every year, many states hosted handloom exhibitions and fashion shows across the country with the support of the administration and local NGOs. साथियों ये भी दुर्भाग्य रहा कि जो वस्त्र उद्योग पिछली शताब्दियों में इतना ताकतवर था उसे आजादी के बाद फिर से सशक्त करने पर उतना जोर नहीं दिया गया The vibrant and exotic festivity of handloom became a celebration of India's rich legacy of hand-woven textiles and the indomitable spirit of the traditional weaving community. They have been instrumental in preserving India's age-old heritage while also contributing to socio-economic progress. During the exhibition, the artisans showcased a variety of indigenous hand-woven and handicraft products simultaneously raising awareness among visitors about the historical and cultural significance of their creations. The visitors would stop by each stall to admire and praise their creativity. यहाँ पे आपको सर देखने को मिलेगा जैसे यहाँ सामने आप देख सकते हो हिम कॉस्ट का वो जो ऑर्गेनिक चीज़ें हैं जैसे चाय पत्ती हो गई हैंडलूम हैंडीक्राफ्ट के जो भी शॉल बनते हैं स्काफ बनते हैं मफलर बनते हैं टोकरियाँ हो गई और हमारे स्टॉल में स्पेशली आपको देखने को मिलेगा चंबा रुमाल और मेटल आर्ट जो कि मंडी का फेमस है Integrate craftsmanship displayed by India's handloom artisans offers just a glimpse into the vast vibrant cultural heritage of the country. Events like these are essential to bring attention to the importance of these traditional art forms. They also provide a platform for artisans to share their work with the world and receive fair compensation for their skills. So next time you come across any such exhibition, remember to take a moment to appreciate and admire their incredible creations. Indian handloom industry has made remarkable progress over time. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.